open this. Uh, okay. Fine. Okay, you tell us. Yeah, so, I'm going to begin by asking, you know, what this idea of the moment is this in order to get started. So, okay. so should we start? Okay, I'm here at the Ecole Supérieure in Paris with Frédéric Worms, who's a professor of philosophy. And I, I mean, just to begin somewhere, we have a theory of the moment, and that history is somehow, the history of philosophy is defined by moments, and you describe them as consisting of rupture, somehow, you know, ruptures, and even parasites, but also reconnections, etc., etc. You said somewhere in an interview that I saw, uh, I think it was YouTube, that, that this is a moment of the living, of the vie of the vivant, so right. the living being, the living entity. I mean, so what is this moment of the living? I, I guess this is where you want to place your own work, in this moment of the living. So, so what would that be? Absolutely. In fact, I think, um, I think it's now become obvious for everybody, but when I formulated it, formulated it for the first time, it was, um, it was more seen as a personal uh, hypothesis. To me, a philosophical moment is a, is a distinct uh, period of time uh, with a before and an after, which is defined um, by not only a psychological rupture between individuals, such as the concept of parasite would imply, or the concept of generations too, that you, you have to kill your father and uh, to become yourself. It's more um, a sort of collective and historical uh, rupture between major um, uh, points of view or framing of, of um, global problems, between global problems, such as, for example, for me, and, and these problems emerge at the crossroads of various disciplines. So that for me, for example, in the, from the 1600s to the 80s, and not only in France, it was a, a, a period where um, the global uh, human mm. and philosophical questions were set through linguistical frames and uh, anthropological frames, cultural, cultural schemes, and anthropological as meaning cut from nature, precisely. Man not being uh, an empirical and living being, but man being a historical being, a semiotical being, a meaning being, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. And that came from phenomenology, from analytic philosophy, from um, what we call human sciences in, uh, in France. The linguistic turn, as that. Linguistic exactly. turn, was, exactly. that's how it was. Yeah, exactly. And in the beginning of the 80s, to me, uh, that's where it started, from the <coughs> emergence of the biological questions, mm -hmm. even with neurology, the, the questions of the brain, mm -hmm. with the emergence, emergence of um, natural history and uh, climate mm -hmm. questions, with, for example, in Germany, in the late 70s, uh, Ancionas uh, responsibility mm -hmm. principle, and <clears throat> from various points of uh, departure, emerged the idea that uh, the feeling, the problem, that maybe the, the, the point of view about to understand human questions is biological and more largely vital, as I would put it. And of course now it's become obvious. It's become obvious that history has to be thought in terms of uh, vital dangers and vital and biological origins, that um, a thought is to be defined at the crossroads between um, the brain and society, society being itself maybe a biological function, and uh, uh, anthropology being also a, a way of describing now the, the place of man with, between other animals and, and in a living world. Yeah. So life is no, not a local question anymore. Life and death, to me, mm. which is, leads to another important aspect of moments. Life is now the global frame for mm. any question. And when I say life and death, I'm already taking my own stance in this moment, mm. because to me a moment is not only a theme, it's a problem. So when you have a global problem, it still is a problem. It's not a theme, it's not a history of ideas, it's a history of, of questions mm. and various points of view on these questions. And to me, when I say life and death, it means that what emerged, um, according to me, is not only life as a, as a global uh, foundation, it's more an experience of both being a living being and being fragile and mortal, Li mm. vital and mortal mm. being. Mm. And, Separable. So that's my personal stance, yeah. which I call now critical vit vitalism. But uh, 
But I do think that uh, it's only one possible position in a global uh, problem where you have many other positions possible, and that's what I call a moment. Yeah. We'll come back to the moment, I think, and to the other. In a moment. Yeah, in a moment. <laughs> but also, I mean, you're, you have also been very, I would say, crucial in the French context of revising another moment, I mean, the moment of Baxon. Right. So what was Baxon's moment? I mean, is, is that still ours? Or, I mean, you're picking up Baxon, but you must also transform it somehow by, why Baxon today? It's interesting because, of course, I assume uh, partly a retrospective look in this no. history of philosophy, which sometimes people say Bergson criticized because he criticized the, the retrospective yeah. effect yeah. and illusion, but he didn't criticize it only. He, he criticized it because when you're not conscious of the retrospection, yeah. of course you're a, you're an, you live in an illusion, but then you can't avoid to have a retrospective yeah. look. So the retrospection is both uh, an illusion and a necessity. Yeah. So when I started to work on Bergson, I was still part of the linguistic turn, yeah, yeah, so to yeah. speak, and I wanted to study, I was interested by, in Bergson for various reasons, for the way he was, he was a concrete link between um, the history of French philosophy yeah. and, and my present. Yeah. It was sort of more subjective than I thought, but I still wanted to, to bring him back in the field of serious, structuralist mm. philosophy with a, to, to prove that he was a, 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 a classic, classical mm. philosopher which was contested at the time. Uh, and then now, yeah. of course, now if you ask me now, I, I would say it, it was already a sign of the yeah. moment du vivant because now, of course, he's a big thinker of the living and life yeah. is at the center of his philosophy, but it is life in a metaphysical and psychological sense Duration for yeah, him yeah. is a psychological act, and it's at work in evolution and elan vital. Yeah. So, to me, the moment Bergson's moment historically is not centered on life, but on spirit yeah. and mind, more than life. Yeah. Which is now, now we are more vi vitalist than Bergson yeah. would have ever even dreamed of yeah, being. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, the I mean, the whole idea of vitalism was also very important in that time, also in Germany, uh, right. et cetera, et cetera. Of course, yeah. I wanted to ask, you know, there's this famous quote from Husserl, where uh, I, he's reported to have said this to Alexandre Coiré when he was in Paris to give the Meditation Cartesian. We are the true Bergsonians. We are the true Bergsonians. I mean, how do you perceive that? I mean, from, from your angle, or, or is Husserl, are you the true, are you the true Husserlian? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... Um, I mean, but also given the strong influence of feminology in French. Yeah, that, that's very, that's very interesting. It, I think it was, um, it's a word by Husserl. Uh, it's been a while since I uh, haven't thought about this fra this uh, phrase. But um, retrospectively, you could say, um, it's like when Kant said, uh, no, it's not Kant himself, but it's Eric Weil speaking about Kant. Oh. But of, of course, it was very Kantian. Eric Weil said of Kant that. Uh, uh, Rousseau needed Kant to, to think the thought of Rousseau yeah. because yeah. Rousseau was writing in an affective yeah. literary way and you need technical yeah. philosophy to bring it back. Yeah. So what Rousseau meant was that he would take back from Bergson the, the, the need to go back to things themselves beyond our practical yeah. thinking. Mm. And Heidegger did that too, in fact. We are, according to Bergson, we are distant from reality because of practical needs. And then we have to go to things themselves. Mm. So Husserl and Heidegger took back this criticism of our practicalities mm. to go back to a pure intuition of things. Except, of course, there is a big difference. Mm. Yeah. Because for Husserl, the true intuition, this is why he said, we are the true Bergsonians. Mm. Yeah. We are the Bergsonians going back to truth. Yeah, 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 sure. And uh, of course, the intuition in, in Husserl's mm. uh, sense is logical or theoretical. In a Heidegger sense, it is existential. In both senses, it is distant from life. Whereas for Bergson, you, you, you leave one side of life, which is the practical sense of life, because you need to survive, then you have to, 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 to divide reality between useful and, and dangerous things. And, and in the human mind, you have to divide reality into objects, useful objects, and, and the rest disappears. Mm. But when you go back to the rest, for Bergson, you go back to real life, 
which of course but Husserl and Heidegger would not accept. So it's what I call Bergson or the two meanings or the two senses of living. Yeah. So Husserl was able, capable of her irony, which is good. Well, I mean, he wanted to have this. I mean, I think the difference would be that Husserl you know, was aiming for this strong Wissenschaft, the rigorous science. And yes. he would say Bergson was not, didn't have the same aim as. Not as in the as same as sense, as but as he was aiming for a rigorous philosophy uh, yeah, too. Yeah. No, I think we'll, we'll come back to Bergson and the. Okay. As it were, by the way, I mean, I just want to ask you, I mean, the bad song was somehow, had somehow disappeared in French philosophy. I would think how you perceive the book by Deleuze in 64, Bergsonism. 66, 66, 66, I think. maybe, yeah. Was that important in that moment? Yeah, Deleuze's book was, was central because um, indeed Bergson was forbidden, so to yeah. speak, for political reasons. And even Deleuze, who insists on Bergson method mm -hmm. as an intuition, but as a method, as a rigorous method, and a method of distinction, yeah. which was great, which is true, mm -hmm. space, time, mm -hmm. memory, and perception, and so forth. So he was, um, he was uh, uh, treating Bergson as a rigorous philosopher, but there is one book by Bergson where the title itself is a distinction. Mm -hmm the two sources of morality and religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't find one sentence by Deleuze on this book no, no. because the, the political interdit was, was still... Uh, uh, That's not the First World War, obviously. Yeah, because of also the, this vitalist theory of morals, the closed and the open, yeah. which is also leading to a theory of mysticism, mm -hmm. but to me a mysticism that is grounded on ethical yeah. criteria. Yeah. And Deleuze would not accept that, no, of no. course. But still, Deleuze, of course, was a major book because uh, because he was uh, reformulating Bergson. It was, to me, a reprise. Yeah. It was a really untimely book at the time in '66. Exactly, yeah. like all great books. But, yeah, great. So uh, we can leave Bresson for a while. But I'm thinking, okay. now, I mean, your own work here. I mean, now you've seen all these interviews about bioethics and all these very you know, okay. key issues in right. contemporary everything from you know. Uh, artificial, uh, no, no, getting children through right. incubation, whatever. Right. And how do you see the role of philosophy here? I mean, I mean that there is in, is in Sweden, in the U.S., in the Anglo-Saxon world, all these debates about philosophers becoming experts in ethics. You know, mm -hmm. you, you hire like a committee, you have an expert in ethics, which, which I find slightly objectionable. <laughs> but how do you see the role of philosophy in that? Well, in those debates? I don't know if it's ex I don't know if it's an expertise, yeah. indeed. I will go back to this concept, but I think there is a specific specificity of philosophy, and the specificity of philosophy is to to go back to the principles behind different positions. Mm. So you have a problem emerging from a technique, for example, um, can we use any uh, artificial reproductive uh, technique, and um, or, or, or could we not? Some people are for or against mm -hmm. for some reasons. The, the business of the philosopher, the job of the philosopher is to go back from these um, uh, formulated reasons and opinions to the principles behind. So why, why would you be for or against? And, and what should be the orientation of an ethical, um, uh, of an ethical position in a, in a vital um, technique between human beings? So you have to, two jobs to me. First, you have to, sort of technical job of philosophy. Your position is in, in the, in the in the final analysis, as we said in French, mm. you know, uh, en dernière analyse. Mm. En dernière analyse, for example, the position of the, of the doctors are ethic, eh, bioethic, the ethical the ethics of medicine. In, in the end, utilitarian, which is not an insult. Mm. No. It's an ethics. Yeah, sure. But it has to be explicit. Yeah. And then you have some people who, who would, for example, have a, a sacrality of life, which is not my case, no. because for me you have this polarity between life and death. So you have to explicit the, the, all the principles of every position, and then you have to also to take a stance on what is, in the end, an eth ethical criteria for you in this position. And of course, in the end, too, this, this definition of philosophy goes directly to democracy. Mm. Because if philosophy is framing the various principles for various possible ethically correct yeah. positions, then you have to insist on the plurality of argumentations, 
with also the need to define some, some criteria. And, and so this is directly leading us to democracy, democracy being the regime where you have institutions for um, compatible disagreements and, and also limits and unacceptable positions too. So I mean, I saw this interview with you saying that, that in the end you find, as it were, different or incompatible or incommensurable ethical positions and systems. But would philosophy at all be able to solve these questions, or, or will it just somehow would have to suffice by, by saying these are different positions? I mean, is there an answer to be given by the I philosophy? Think, I think uh, uh, having a solution based on pluralism is a solution. Yeah. It's not a relativism, yeah. it's, a, it's a position. And, but I do think I have my philosophical yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, principles too, which is, which are based on uh, the relationship between concrete human beings, being torn between mm -hmm. different imperatives, mm -hmm. not uh, destroying the other's mm -hmm. life, and also uh, respecting... Um, there are many ways for a human being to kill another human yeah. being. It's not only uh, uh, biological, mm -hmm. you can also uh, oppress his, uh, his liberty and uh, not... So, so you have to conciliate different imperatives. and So I have my own mm. critical yeah. vitalist yeah. Uh, position, yeah. but I do think in the end, uh, and it's compatible with this position, you have to defend what is, what is not relative is a frame for a compatible uh, but different uh, uh, philosophical positions yeah. in a democratic yeah. space. Thinking fun. I mean, there are so many uh, philosophers in various you know, creeds and traditions. They work on, on questions of bioethics that often have a very, as it were, applied philosophy to yeah. various medical things. And so, in, in one sense, there is philosophy looking to new problems that emerge because of technological breakthroughs. And that would be a bioethics, in the sense ethics having mm -hmm. the, the bios as its object. Right. But would there also be which I think is in your work a little bit, in that, the other idea that there is an ethos coming out of the bias, so that the, the, the biology can somehow teach us something about Yes, ethics. absolutely. And I do think, for example, that um, we have to, we don't, inv we don't invent bioethics as only as philosophers. No. It is also being invented by society as a compromises that take place in law, for example, mm -hmm. because law is also the place where you solve the compromises yeah. and yeah. the oppositions. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's take a concrete example. The concept of uh, giving is central in French bioethical law. Okay. And uh, giving, how? In what sense? Giving, for example, organ. Okay. Organ. Organ donation. Organ donation. Yeah. Organ donation. You you can't. Why is donation mm. and giving so central? Mm. With leading to a lot of paradoxical mm. positions. For example, you have the question of how a dead man can give mm. his organs. Mm. Um, and then you have the donation of your genome now, your, gene your data. Yeah. Your data now are to be given, which is so interesting, mm -hmm. etymologically and not only. What, what, why is it so important? Because giving there, donate, donating, mm -hmm. is a compromise. It, you, need to, you need to transfer one part of human body to another one to save the other one's life. But then this part of the body that you need to give to another body is is not an object you can, in French bioethics, it's not an object belonging to the subject. No, no. It's part of the person. So you can't sell it. Mm. You can't, of course, mm. impose, ob ob oblige mm. someone to give it. No. So there's no merchandising, there's no, there's no obligation. Of course, there's no violence. No. So the only ethical way to transfer the object to save one's life while respecting the other's person is free donation. So it leads mm. to many complications because when someone dies and you want his heart to say what well, you have to ask the, 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 yeah, the family and so forth. So the, the bioethics is an invention of specific mm. categories and you have many like that. Mm. Uh, you have also another very important uh, question in the end of life uh, euthanasia mm. is the um, Personne de confiance, as we say in French, as you say in English, I don't know, uh, the, the trust uh, person, yeah, yeah. The, the trust person that you, the person who, who is the, the representative yeah. for, for, and why is it important? Because this person, if you have a biological stance, it should be the father and the mother. Yeah, yeah. If you have a, who should it be? Mm -hmm. And of course, it, it's an invention. It's, that, that makes it conventional. 
it's, it's designated by the free subject, mm -hmm. but of course he's what Ricoeur called a proche. Mm -hmm. So he's part of my life more yeah. than my parents. Yeah. It's not automatically my no. parents or my children. So it's very interesting. Bioethics is an invention of categories. Yeah. Which is an invention which is probably ongoing because of new scientific things will, will cause new problems to emerge. Yeah. But I know, in, for instance, this book I just gave me, Pour Humanisme Vital, towards vital humanism. I mean, you, you have been opposing all this movement of transhumanism and this almost like sci fi theories about longevity, living forever, etc. So, which are, of course, a bit silly sometimes. <laughs> I mean, what is the vital humanist mean to you? It's, it's, uh... Well, I have two regrets about this book. It's okay. its title and, and somehow its form. I, I should have called it more specifically towards a critical vitalism. Okay. Because, in fact, to me, it's totally synonym. Okay. Because a critical vitalism is based on life, but I don't know what life is, aside from three oppositions, life and death differences between the living mm. beings, so the human do have mm. a specific kind of living, and then of course also life being th seen uh, the, in an um, assumed manner from our critical point of view. So we don't mm. know what life is in, mm. per se, but life is still, a, you know, we can't mm. go beyond. So it's, it's a critical vitalism in these three senses that leads me to also the specificity of human being within vital limits, so to a vital humanism. So to me it's totally synonym, but when I said vital humanism, nobody seems to have understood the, the paradox, no. that I'm not a classical humanist, but I am criticizing essential uh, redu redu reductive mm. vitalisms. And so um, I, I should have called it critical vitalism. Maybe it's more technical, mm. but I think it's more understandable. And the second, not mistake, I don't regret it. It's, I wrote it in the letter form, epistolary, mm. because it was, to me, consistent with um, the main thesis that we are relational, vital, human, vital yeah. living beings. Yeah. And I did try some literary forms mm. in my books, in a book called Revivre, which has also some poems in it, in a book called Penser à quelqu'un, yeah. which is the main thesis is really yeah. that we think only in vital relationships, vital and mortal. And so I had to try consistent ways of writing, consistent with the content of the yeah. writing, but I think it, it, in the end it made the book difficult, difficult the to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about this book, Pensier Kirkham, to think about someone. Yeah. Uh, this interview says that, I mean, as it were, primordially speaking, we don't think about something that is basically an object. So I would say perhaps that that philosophically means that epistemology or is not the first philosophy, but think about someone which is an ethical or interpersonal, intersubjective relation. Uh, I know you also could decide to live in us in that concept because he thought that this someone was not the physical or mental or corporeal being with something else. I mean, can you say something else? Is this a proper reading in your work that, that ethics would precede or some kind of ethical relation would precede the epistemological connection to the world? In a way, but it's, it's, it's not the ethics as opposed to, to life precisely yeah. because, for example, one, one point I defend is that um, um, we, we, we can think about anything only if we exist as a subject. And of course, we exist as, a subjects, as subjects, we, human living beings, only if someone has thought about us in the primary relationships, which uh, psychology and psychoanalysis to describe very precisely in the attachment theory. So if, if no one has treated you as an individual subject, you will not become an individual subject. So, so this is where thinking is really a vital activity in the sense of evolutionary mm -hmm. theory, because we wouldn't survive, and in the sense also of uh, individual life that we wouldn't exist. So, so it's really, of course, uh, it's, it's a theory of thinking, it's a theory of ethics, but it's vitalist. Yeah, yeah. It's vitalist because it's a fact that if, if no one thinks about us in this way, we die. No. And it's a fact also that thinking about someone is never neutral. It's, it's, we think in terms of love or hate. Mm. And so it's ethical in the sense of a vital polarity that we don't invent. It's descriptive ethics. It's, not normative. it's normative in the Kangilemian sense. Mm. 
but it's not inventing a transcendence. Yeah. It's a it's a polarity that's given between us, and it's it's the specificity of human beings that we can destroy one another not only by fighting or or fighting for food and water, but also yeah. by by loving and hating each other. I think if one looks at so I'm defending negativity yeah. too. Huh? I think if one looks at Anglo-Saxon analytic philosophy, I would say a lot of people would say yes. It's uh, uh, there's a certain question of life emerging about animal life. And right. It has the strong ethical implications, but it really hinges upon not seeing, perceiving any kind of priority of, of you know of, of of the human being. You know, animal life. What Peter Singer and others would say that the problem about ethics concerning life is that we tend to distinguish humans from other living beings. How do you perceive that? Well, precisely, I, I, I think we can go beyond, we have to go beyond this opposition thanks to the concept of, a uh, uh, um, complete concept of life. Mm. Because in the end, all the um, um, reductions to, of human ethics to all the, all, all the other living being ethics is based on uh, on utilitarianism, that is, the only criterion is uh, is life and death and pleasure and pain, which is in 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 a sense true. Is yeah. it's the only criterion? And then the opposition, the the transcendent, transcendental or transcendent ethics making a specificity of human beings will will say no. We are thinking beings, like in Kant, yeah. or we are. Um, we have a duty, we have a, and we can sacrifice life for in human relationships, like in Hegel, and of course for, for Levinas too, there is this transcendence of not killing for any reason. So this is, uh, this is true too, so in a way. But what is the concrete point is that to me, uh, there are specific pleasure and more specifically pains and sufferings in, in the life of human beings. So we, you don't leave utilitarianism in a way. You don't leave pleasure and pain. You never leave life and death. But you have specific ways of inflicting death and, and, and pain to, to human, between human beings that call for specificity within the realm of life, not beyond it, but within it. And, and to me, we experience that every day. So we are more fragile than any other vital being is in, in some sense, because we are fragile as individuals, we are fragile as uh, political beings, we, are, we have many fragility, we can die of many, of many uh, a blow, <laughs> many a blow. I was thinking about coming back to this idea of, of the moment. I mean, the, there's a moment Obviously, there's also tensions inside the moment. There are oppositional forces. And, and I don't know if you want to comment on this, but I saw this very brief interview when you spoke about pseudo-radical philosophers. But I mean, you do not need to mention names, but who would be the opposite side? And this, obviously, at the moment, is like also a moment of division between different positions. So, I mean, who would be your opponent in this? I mean, is, does that question make sense to you? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course, I am a critical thinker in, yeah, a, yeah. in the way, in the sense that I assume that I, I can describe my position as opposed to... Are, are you filming now? Yes. Yeah, sure. I can describe my position mm. in uh, terms of very simple oppositions. Mm. I, I oppose people who criticize vitalism, mm. who think that there are a uh, transcendence uh, principle where if, for the sake of which you can sacrifice life. Mm. For example, of course, um, uh, for example, um, um, the philosophy of Alain Badiou is clearly on that mm -hmm. side yeah, yeah, yeah. because life to him doesn't mean much. Mm -hmm. um, and even sacrificing life seems to be very easy, which mm -hmm. it isn't. Which it is possible to sacrifice life, but uh, only for vital reasons, so yeah. to speak, and, and, and for fighting against death reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, you can, you can you can accept death only in the sake of fighting against death. And you can have worse than death experiences which allow for sacrificing your life, but it's not as uh, going beyond the opposition between life and death. And then you have these second adversaries which are uh, essentializing vitalists, vitalists so which, who, who do not accept that life isn't anything beyond the opposition mm. between life and death. 
And these are, there are many of those, and, um, and uh, maybe one I could quote is because he's, he's a figure going from one radicalism to another, is Agamben in the sense of uh, biopower, yeah, yeah. which um, in one sense is theorist, theorizing a life beyond animal life. Yeah. A political life that wouldn't be a, 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 a concrete life anymore, and, and a capacity of the power to reduce us to, to mere life, mere living beings, which to me um, is, is more a, a worse than death experience yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a very, very real possibility, yeah. though. I had a sense when I saw this very brief interview, with only like one minute, yeah. uh, that you were perhaps opposing a certain sense of philosophy which is about very lofty speculations and extreme statements. You want to go back to some, some uh, the basic experiential facts, everyday life, and that, that was, we need to have a kind of philosophy that can attach itself to the concrete problems that we have today. I, I, I thought that was your proposal. Well, in interview. Um, to me, as I said, philosophy is the activity of, uh, of going back to principles out of experience. Mm -hmm. It's pre the, the very... Very Kantian. <laughs> yeah, okay. but primal facts are, to me, are what I call exclamations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the experience of one experience that calls for a, a, a major uh, statement. Uh, let's say, for example, beyond, uh, in front of something, you say it's terrible yeah. or it's beautiful. So that's both taken in the experience and asserting a principle. And so philosophy is the act of, um, of a justifying this, this, this kind of experiments. So philosophy is typically uh, 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 go coming out of the, of the specificity of human experience in, in life. And, uh, and so that's why we explicit negative principles and positive principles all the time. But philosophy is expliciting principles. It's not only a practical and a vital in, in a re mm. reduction no, no, sense. No. I mean, I just want to end here by asking a final question, which is more general. You know, in this series, we have states of philosophy. It's about trying to somehow map the condition today, the state or the states of philosophy today. I mean, um, I mean, you have described the fact that this moment, as you see it, this, this question of life and vitalism opposes itself in a very obvious way. Uh, if one looks at French philosophy in particular, because we're in France, we're in Paris now, uh, would you say that this is something that, that is occurring over the, in a more general sense? Is this something which is really emerging all over the field? The question of life, you mean? Yes, yes. Or the kind of questions you, you, have, you have been open now. No, I do think it is, uh, it, it is global. Yeah. I mean, it, how would one characterize the French? I mean, the French, French way. The French philosophy. First, let me tell you how it's global. Yeah. It's global because of science, yeah. which establishes that uh, that we are made out of uh, biological facts and that uh, we are part of a species that is threatened, for example, by climate change and so forth. So it's global facts, and it's also global because we share a human condition and. And I think everywhere, and so if you have, if you are an analytic philosopher, maybe you don't think about life, but in fact you, you do, yeah. because you are connected to cognitive science, and cognitive science is a biological thinking. Absolutely. And if you are, well, then you can deny, of course, and I also have to accept uh, the psychical complexity of human beings that, that are constantly denying their own conditions and even going towards death, and so forth. What is specifically French to me, it's, um, it's connecting to, to what has been defined in France and as French in the past. Yeah. So it's, the, it's uh, very empirical too. It's uh, what has been uh, uh, defined as, as, um, as uh, uh, internal debates in France, French philosophy as such. So of course, if you refer to Bergson, you are in a sort of French debate because French has, Bergson was French, but also he defined the kind of debate in his moment, um, and if you take back Deleuze and Foucault. To me, and I'm going to, it's funny because the, the, the paper I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to transfer the, the direction of the French Philosophy Center to someone else today. <laughs> and it's a very moving moment for me because I've been directing it for 18 years. And I'm going to say that um, speaking of French philosophy can be, it can be it's like vitalism. Yeah. You can have an essential meaning for French. What is French? 
like, and then you go back to Camembert, mm -hmm. to French Revolution, Descartes, I don't know what essence of France. And you have another very opposite way of taking it, which is very empirical and open. Is French what has been discussed in France and uh, which has been defined over the years as a, as a controversy? Then you have to, to um, in France, and it has been also um, uh, institutionally uh, accepted as philosophy in France and so forth. And, and of course, this second sense is my sense, very empirical, historical. And it's not neutral philosophically. You have uh, you have some some words. You have some, and it also explains you because some French philosophers said they were in French, like Bouvres, who mm -hmm. said he was very un-French. And I say some 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 philosophers who are not French are in fact French because they think in the in, <laughs> with the concepts of Foucault and Derrida or, or who else. So it's a very empirical meaning, and of course you have some specificities. It's, um, it's not a philosophy defined by a, by a scientific, unique scientific approach, like phenomenology or analytic philosophy. It's a philosophy relating to science, but not itself scientific. And admitting that you have a, a way of going back to principles that is creative, uh, problematic, historical, without denying the science and uh, as such. So it's not anti-scientific, but it's not pretending to be. It's, a, it's a assuming the specificity of philosophy, which is also very uh, French. <laughs> I remember a moment in my department like 10 years ago where someone asked the question. There was a lecture about phenomenology and Husserl and rigorous science and someone said, but now we have to ask the question really to the audience, is philosophy a science or not? Uh -huh. And 10 people said yes, 10 said no. Really? <laughs> That's uh, interesting. So perhaps the answer must be in between somehow. It must be yes and no. To some it, it, should be, it should be no, but it should be... Also yes to some extent. It yes. should not be yes, maybe. It should be rigorous, mm. but it should be connected to yeah. science. Yeah. Because you can't do any philosophy without the scientific mm. problems yeah. of your time. So it's not the science, but it's inseparable from sciences, from yeah. old sciences. Okay. And that's yeah. one way to, uh, to, yeah, to put it. You must prepare your lecture. Yeah.